But first of all, maybe if I'm being curious here, architecture is something that is kind of like words that is not commonly associated with, you know, like when you want to build something, you have to go with the architecture first. But some people actually say we should not go with architecture first. But in the first place, why is actually architecture? Is it so important for us to actually start with an architecture in mind? Yeah, so that's a very good question. What is software architecture? My core belief is that architecture is not something separate to the system, right? It is the system. As I think Baz Clements and Kalsman in their book say, every software system has a software architecture. In our first book, we call that the realized architecture, which basically says, as an architect, when you think about a software product, your main focus is to implement what's running in production. That is the architecture. So your architecture is always there. It always exists. It's not something separate. It's not a piece of paper or it's not a diagram. Though they can be very useful to communicate the architecture, the architecture is always there. So when you say, should we focus on architecture or not, it's really how conscious you are about the decisions you make to influence what's running in production. And if you look at more formal definitions like the IEEE definition of architecture, it really is about defining components, their responsibilities, and their relationships. So that's what a more formal definition is. But my view is your job is to influence what's running in production and to make sure you make the right decisions so that you have a sustainable product. It's very interesting definition. I actually haven't heard about this. It's actually to decide what you are going to implement for systems that is running in production. I really love this definition because sometimes we think architecture is like a high level thing. So you come up with a big design up front, you draw component diagrams, but essentially whether it gets translated to production or not, we are not pretty sure. So when you say about having this architecture implemented in production, I think this is very crucial for me. Because so many people are probably not conscious about how the system gets implemented, which is why earlier I said, I haven't seen a lot of UML diagrams, a lot of architecture diagram. So maybe you can comment a little bit from here, from your experience recently. Is this still a case that people writing big upfront design architecture, or is it something that is already changing a lot? I think it is changing a lot. And that's why we wrote our books as well. To give a little more context on the two books, the first one, Continuous Architecture, was written in 2016. And then the recent one just came out this year, which is Continuous Architecture in Practice. The premise of those books was to bridge that gap, right? Because there is that traditional view of architecture being big design up front, separate groups, separate teams, you know, especially in large corporations, you have these teams that would come and review what you've done once in a while and tell you you're wrong you know, and things like that. And that is, I guess, the negative vision of architecture. Then you have the more agile, extreme programming and just continuous delivery world where you just have the teams and they're just saying, we have to implement, we have to implement. We don't need an architecture. We're trying to bridge that gap. I mean, the example we gave is you need to build the cathedral. So the traditional architect says, where's the five-year plan? While the agile developer says, where's the shovel? What we want to do is bridge that gap. We did construct a series of principles and approach and really thoughts on how to do that because we believe architecture is important because it's about making sure you have a sustainable product. So I like the analogy of building cathedral. So if I can ask you personally, right, just now you said the traditional architect will ask five-year plan while the agilist will probably ask, give me a shuffle. What would be your answer in this case? I would say we have to, it's a little bit of both. It's really around the six principles we have. One thing to clarify, continuous architecture is not an architecture methodology. It's really a mindset and almost a way of working or a way of thinking. So what do our six principles say? The first one is you should architect products. Lots of people think about projects and what I need to implement, but you should think about what is my software product I'm implementing and what is its journey. So in the cathedral example, what is the cathedral, what its purpose, what's my MVP? If you could have an MVP for a cathedral, maybe it's not the best example, but you know, think about your products is the first one. The second one is focus on quality attributes and not on functional requirements. We mean the non-functional requirements of a system, security, scalability, resilience, performance, etc. Because those are the key things that will really test your system or your architecture. So really focus on those, which we tend not to as much, at least formally. And we only sometimes deal with them when we have big issues. The third principle is delay design decisions until they are absolutely necessary. First of all, the core unit of architecture is a design decision. That's a core belief I have. And you have to make the decisions at the right time. That's a principle we took from the agile world. 
again, you can't do a big design up front. You have to evolve and make the key decisions early on, but delay certain decisions till a later point. Because if you don't do that, then you end up over-engineering your system and just build something, try it out, et cetera, and move on. Principle four is architect for change. Leverage the power of small. So that's the loosely coupled, internally coherent components that's been around for a long time. Now, obviously, everyone is talking microservices, but that principle is really around that. Is think about where your architect will change to have independent components that are loosely coupled. Principle five, which is again five years ago, sounded more revolutionary than it does today, is architects for build, test, deploy, and operate. So when you're architect in the system, don't think about just, as I said, the realized architecture, but also you think about how you build it, how you test it, how you deploy it, and how you operate it. So the architecture should cover all of those aspects. And principle six is acknowledgement of the Conway's law, which is model the organization of your teams after the design of the system. And what that means is there's two aspects of that. One is, again, back to the agile world, we truly believe in cross-functional teams. So don't have separate database team that's separate than an app development team that's separate than a testing team, right? We want to avoid that internally coherent things. But also there's a more macro interpretation of that is acknowledge how you are within the organization and what organizational constructs you have. Because Conway's law says that each software system or each system will reflect the communication structures of the organization that builds it. So there is that natural way how organization structure does influence the architecture of the systems that support that organization. And you have to acknowledge that. You either use it as a constraint and you deal with it because you know that's just how it is, or you try to fight it if that's the right fight to go after. But those are the six principles, right? So that would be our answer is think about architecture with those principles in mind. If you apply them consistently, then you'll find that middle of the road between the traditional architect and the developer. So I love all these principles because it seems to cover a lot of trends these days in technology, right? Microservices, architect for change, leverage power of small, Conway's law. A lot of people refer to team topologies, what they call stream aligned team. Also architect for products instead of projects. I think people these days are talking about product oriented mindset instead of project management. So all these seems to be the principles of continuous architecture. But in the first place, you said this is not a methodology. So what is actually continuous architecture? How do you classify it? Is it something that you always have to architect your system every sprint, something like that? No, no, it's not. As I said, it's an approach and it's a way of thinking. So what we've always had two things. We've always said we have our principles and then we have a toolbox of techniques and recommendations we make. So in the first book, I guess our toolbox was more theoretical in the sense that it included things like examples could be how to use sequence diagrams could be one or value chains to understand your business. Or there was uh, techniques like QFD for dealing with mapping requirements at different levels. In our newer book, which is more continuous architecture practice, which I think is, would be much more valuable for a much larger user base. It's all around architectural tactics. What are the architectural tactics of dealing with security, with resilience? What are the architectural decisions you need to make? So in essence, that's what continuous architecture is. It's kind of a belief in those principles and keeping those principles in mind, explicitly making architectural decisions to meet and apply architectural tactics for the software product you have. 